Hey, I'm Charlie Saccarelli, and this is a presentation called Peripheral Prisms for Visual Field Loss. Normally, I would be presenting this in person because I thoroughly enjoy presenting in person rather than talking to a webcam as if it were a person. Um, but uh, given the current pandemic, not really an option. But the cool part is normally when I present, I have to wear pants, which... So that's definitely a luxury of webinars. Without further ado, peripheral prisms for visual field loss. So normally when we try to get a prescription, our goal is to kind of get the fovea, right? So we'll normally use a plus lens if it focuses past the fovea to bring it to the fovea, or if it's a minus, or we'll use a minus lens to get it to the fovea. And then um, we're trying to get to 2020 perfect acuity. That's our goal, right? So that's what we're normally doing with lenses. And this little logo, this is, um, so the term optician is kind of boring because depending on the state, optician can be kind of a watered down term. Um, so I prefer to call myself a light bender, which makes it sound a little bit more superhero esque. Um, also, um, I have a hammock in my office, so since you're going to be with me for the next 45 minutes, um, I think it's probably something that I should address, is that I am a frequent napper, and uh, I found it imperative to have an emergency hammock over things like bookshelves or couches or other kind of executive office type stuff. A hammock is the way to go. <laughs> Um, if you do need one, hit me up. My contact information is at the end. Um, I can I can get you the source for the hammock. It's really cool because it folds up almost like a lawn chair. But anyways, so when we're when we're trying to correct myopia or hyperopia or whatever, um, we're using plus and minus lenses. And then, but what about when a patient has double vision? Then what do we do? Um, now there's two kinds of double vision. So you have the double vision, which is uh, you see two things at once, and then you have this album by foreigner. Um, if you haven't listened to the album by Foreigner, it's a fantastic album, and I would highly recommend listening to it. So this is desirable double vision. This is undesirable double vision. So when we have undesirable double vision, the goal is we want to um, make it one image. And the way we do that is with Prism. So that's stuff I should hope you already know. And I'm going to talk about the brain a little bit. So the brain is pretty cool. Um, right now I'm talking to you. I'm also trying to figure out how to mirror myself because the webcam moves in the opposite direction of me. So if I move left, this moves right. So my brain's trying to wrestle with that all while I'm talking to a webcam. All while I'm trying to... So normally also when I'm lecturing to, a, to people, I can kind of gauge their interest based on how much they're sleeping. Um, right now, I have no such skill, so I'm worried about how do I make this somewhat useful content um, without any feedback from humans in front of me. So my brain's wandering through that, and all while that's happening, um, I'm breathing, right? Like that happened, and then my heart's beating, and all that stuff is happening all at the same time. So the brain's like this ultimate multitasker that does so much stuff, and that's really cool. And uh, if you know much about brains, like this is some third grade level brain stuff, right side of your brain controls the left side of your body, right? Left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. What if vision worked that way? Like I can move my right arm independently from my left arm, right? So if our vision worked the same way the rest of our, uh, the word utensils is coming to mind, but that's not the word, uh, extremities. So if, uh, if, if our vision worked the way as, same way as our extremities, um, we'd have a little bit of a situation because we'd all like walk around kind of looking like fish and we'd be able to look, move one eye at a time. It'd be super weird. Um, but we don't do that. And the reason is that rather than our vision being right, right brain controls left eye, it's right brain controls left side of the vision in each eye. And then your left brain controls the right side of the vision in each eye. So that's pretty neat. Next, I want to talk about visual field. So you have two eyes, um, and it's important because we see out of them. And a lot of times when we look at vision conditions and visual field loss and visual acuity, a lot of times we look at it um, 
we're looking into the eye rather than kind of imagining what it's like to look out of the eye. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like to look out of the eye because that's what our patient sees. They really don't care what their retina looks like. What they care is what they see. So we have two eyes, right? Um, so this, this reflects two eyes. Our one eye, so let's say this is our right eye. So our right eye is about 150 degrees of visual field. So you have about 90 plus out to the side and then about 60 cuts off at your nose. And you can test this. Like if you close the one eye, you can bring in and kind of do a confrontation field on yourself and map out your visual field. So you have about 150 degrees on your right eye, about 150 degrees on your left eye. And then you have about 120 degrees of binocular vision in the center. Now, we know that this is 180, but a lot of times when it's field loss and constricted field, we're talking about um, different numbers. We're talking, I mean, your, your standard visual field test is a 30, a 30 degree or 24 degree visual field test. So how much is that for the patient who is seeing? So here's, um, so this is kind of like, when they used to do building using the measurement of a foot, like an actual human foot, it's not that accurate because my finger's probably chunkier than um, somebody else's. But for, for approximating degrees in smaller amounts, if you hold your pinky at about arm's length, that is about one degree. If you hold your three middle fingers up at arm's length, that's about five degrees. And then your whole hand is about 10 degrees. So if you want to see, hey, what is a 30, what is a 30 dash um, visual field cover? It's about three hand widths of visual field. Now we know that we have vastly more than this three hand widths of visual field. So that's just, just some perspective of what's it like to look out of these eyes when you see a certain visual field. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the pathways. So, because the the halves isn't quite complex enough, it's actually kind of quadrants. So um, the quadrants, so the halves go to the opposite side of the brain, but then the quadrants um, either go kind of up and over or around. So this is um, this is just kind of an interesting path. And in addition, about a third of the information that comes in from the retina gets dropped off here in the geniculate body. Um, where it gets used in kind of non-visual, like things that we don't traditionally think of as visual. So it gets, um, it gets so the information from our retina goes to other parts of the body that might be involved in balance and motor control and just different things that we typically don't associate with vision. Now, of our vision, how does it work? Like, the central, the central vision is primarily our def, def, definite vision, like our accurate, highly precise vision. And that is where our acuity exists. So what this chart represents is this central part is the area of our visual field that acuity wise is 2070 or better. And the reason I use the 2070 threshold is that 2070 is the official kind of, hey, if you can't be better than 2070, you're low vision. So this is the component, this is the part of our visual field that is naturally better than 2070. So the rest of our visual field is, you know, low vision and legally blind. So how do we build, so, so that, that's just another, another thing to consider is that most of our vision, most of our awareness in life is this peripheral vision. And then the other thing is that when you look at a when you look at vision simulations in um, in books and textbooks and videos, a lot of times vision is simulated by a picture. But vision's not really a picture. Vision is more of this. It's a series of saccades and fixations to build a picture in your mind. So you're not. You don't snap a picture like a camera. Um, you don't have constantly high definition. You kind of work your way around to build a picture in your mind. The other important thing is that our visual field moves as our eyes move. So if I'm looking straight ahead, my visual field is 180 degrees this way. If I look to the right, now my visual field is like this. 
So your visual field moves as your eyes move. Now let's talk about what happens when you have some bad luck in the brain. So depending on where in the brain the bad luck happens, your visual field can be different. So if something happens along your optic nerve, you end up with monocular vision. If something happens at the optic chiasm, you end up with bitemporal hemianopsia. So you're blind in both halves, the both, both outside halves. Um, but when you think about bitemporal hemianopsia, that sounds, I mean, it's not pleasant. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but it's actually not as bad as it sounds. Um, because you would think, oh, geez, half of my vision is gone. Um, but this patient would actually have 120 degrees of visual field because they would have the 60 nasal out of each eye. So it's not that bad. That said, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, and then if something happens just along one of these pathways, um, along the up and over or the around, I'm sure that these have more like neurological names, but I'm gonna, just going to call it the, the up and over and the around because I'm an optician. Um, but that would that would leave you with quadrant anopsia. And then what we're mostly going to be talking about today is homonymous hemianopia, which is when something happens to the whole side. So then you're left with half of your vision. So that's half of your vision. Now, hemianopia is interesting in that there's this idea that the visual field is literally cut in half. And what we tend to think is that if somebody has hemianopia, that is their visual field. But it's not quite that simple. So the, hemi the visual field can be different depending on how it comes about. So the, the thing that I see often is a lot of times hemianopia will be a choice. So you'll say, hey, you know, you're going to die from this brain tumor, or we can remove it and we'll just take out half your vision. And they're like, okay, yeah, that's a, that's, that's, a, I don't know if a no brain, a no brainer might not be the appropriate term there, but, um, but that's more like, that's more like a controlled demolition. So it's like you're taken out of building. Um, so you, you kind of have predictable results in that case, but a lot of times, um, hemianopia comes about as a result of a stroke and a stroke is a lot more like a natural disaster in that we really don't know what's going to happen. So this might look like, this might be what hemianopia looks like. This might be what hemianopia looks like. Who knows? This might be what hemianopia looks like. So what we're going to pretend when we're talking about prisms and how they work is that we have this kind of traditional classic hemianopia. But I hope to convey to you the principles behind it so that if you do encounter a case that is not the same, you won't end up trying um, to work it in a way that's not helpful. Because ultimately, what we're trying to do with peripheral prisms is gain visual field. And if we aren't gaining visual field, the, per the peripheral prisms have no function. So just for, for all intents and purposes for now, we're going to pretend that this is the perfect hemianopia. And then at the end, I'll be talking about some kind of unique cases that I've encountered and some solutions that we've come up with. So before we had 180 degrees, right? So we had 120, um, 120 central and uh, you know 150 in each individual eye. So in this case, we're also going to pretend it's left hemianopia. Hemianopia can happen on either side, but we're going to pretend it's left because um, you can just kind of flip it for right. So your right eye, after, after this hemianopia, you're going to have 90 degrees. So basically, I would see from here to here. That's my right eye. Now, my left eye would be here to here. So my binocular vision would be this. So my binocular vision would be this to this. Now, 90 degrees. So the, the, the other thing that we talk about a lot is the number of degrees of visual field. And I kind of, I mean, this is not a terribly accurate um, 
analogy, but I tend to try to think of the visual field more like an archery target in that the center is like, hey, that's the most important, and then work it out. Um, so 90 degrees as just a number, this 90 degrees is a lot worse than this 90 degrees. So they could both be 90 degrees, um, but 90 degrees doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. The number of degrees doesn't tell the whole story. It's where is the number of degrees that makes a difference. A lot of times, um, the patients with, with, a, with a peripheral loss won't necessarily even know that they have a peripheral loss until they get to that um, 90 degree area. So what do we lose when we have a hemianopia? So our central vision is in the middle and our, the rest is our kind of uh, peripheral vision. So when we have a stroke, we lose, what we lose is mostly peripheral vision. So we do lose central. A lot of times there's something called macular, uh, macular sparing where you actually do retain most of your central vision, but we lose mostly peripheral. So a lot of patients with hemianopia will have perfect acuity. So if you show them a, a distance card, they can actually read it. Like they can, they can show, they can pass an acuity test. Um, but what they lose is this peripheral vision. Now, what's kind of misleading is what we see, what the patient sees versus what we look at in books to reflect what, what uh, visual field loss looks like. So this is a typical simulation of hemianopia. So these are uh, uh, graciously lifted from the web. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of what hemianopia is like, and then these are pictures of what hemianopia is like. So what that leads one to believe is that your visual field loss is black. And by turning it black, it would insinuate that you are conscious of your field loss. You would, it would insinuate that you have a massive black spot in your vision. But in reality, it's not like that. It's more like the physiological blind spot where you're not consciously aware of it until you go out of your way to see that it exists. So this can be misleading because it even, even in cases... So there, there's also this, this idea of neglect. So neglect, you see the picture of the half clock, and that's neglect. And then you see the picture of the full clock, and that's not neglect. So when somebody doesn't have neglect, we assume that they are consciously aware of their blind side all the time. Now, just to put that in a little bit of perspective, I have a visual field of 180 degrees, and I have 180 degrees behind me. I am consciously aware of the 180 degrees behind me, but I don't constantly look in to the 180 degrees behind me. So even though I'm aware of it, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it or thinking about it or looking into it, even though I'm aware that it exists. So a lot of times we think that, okay, hey, if this patient doesn't have neglect, then everything is fine and they're cognizant and all is well. It doesn't mean that either. So let's talk a little bit more um, about what this patient would see. I'm going to move into a world of black and white because um, rather than this, this where the visual field is black, if we turn it to black and white, what we can do is, is move into this uh, kind of like the aha video where uh, take on me. And if you're watching this and you've never heard of this, I'm sorry for how old I am and I get older every year students stay the same age so ouch but look up the video it's actually a really good song and a cool video so anyways it's a black and white video but i'm going to go to a black and white picture of a farm to show you kind of what this patient sees so this is a person with a normal field so we have um, the kids we have the farmers with their hoes and then the ladies with their rakes these are hoes so this is that visual field as you look straight ahead now, if you take that same scene with a homonymous hemianopia, now it's cut in half. So now the kids and the ladies are gone, and we still have the dudes with their pipes from this weird 1950s farm scene. Now, if the patient looks to the left a little bit, now they can get the lady back, but now they lost the son over here. 
And if they look all the way to the left, now they can see the kids and the ladies, but now they lost these dudes that are just in front of them and they'll trip over a hoe. So what do we do? So I, I picture that, um, so because, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I picture myself as a superhero, which is a pretty lame assessment of oneself that just makes eyeglasses. But um, I, fig I figured that like me and my group of superhero opticians would get together and say, light benders assemble. And then we would say prison power, and then we would like fly off and save the world. Um, and that's how much of a dork I am. So our mission, Lightbenders, is to uh, get some more visual field. So right now we have this 90 degrees of visual field, which is not enough. And we want some awareness of this area over here. So I'm going to go through some previous um, variations of of homonymous hemianopia and lenses for them to kind of show you how they work or don't work um, before I get to peripheral prisms. So the first was um, called bilateral sector prism. So what a bilateral sector prism is, is you put a prism in the area where the patient is blind. So I've made this, which is a simulator of, um, of hemianopia just to kind of show you where the prisms would go. So we would put the prism where the green tape is, which is right there and right there. So you would put the prism in the green tape and then you would instruct the patient to look into the area where they're blind when they think there might be something that's going to obstruct them sometime in the near future. And if that sounds like a silly premise, well, it kind of is. So this, um, rather than the farm, we're going to move to a petting zoo just to keep things simple. So this, um, this course was originally designed uh, for a group of orthoptists in Australia. And when I was going to Australia, everybody said, hey, be careful, everything's trying to kill you. So this is my visualization of what an Australian petting zoo would look like. So we have a poisonous jellyfish, a poisonous frog, a poisonous goat, a kangaroo, and then a spider the size of a kangaroo. So that's the visual field, the petting zoo with the full visual field. Now let's talk about the hemivisual field. So now we have the hemivisual field. So now we lost the frog and we lost the jellyfish. So we still have our goat, our kangaroo, and our spider. Now, what happens when we look straight ahead when we wear these prisms? So when we look straight ahead, nothing happens, right? So when we look straight ahead, we still see what we saw. Now it's time to look at the frog. So what happens? Let's turn our eyes to look at the frog and see what happens. Now, the other thing is I put the same lens because both eyes have the same treatment. Um, I put the same lens in, so this will essentially be what happens to both eyes. So let's look at the frog. That's a jellyfish. Where's the frog? So this is called an apical scotoma. So what this is is at the apex of a prism, the last light ray before the prism goes in front of the frog, the first light ray into the prism goes past the frog and makes the frog disappear. Now, that's kind of cool, um, unless you're, you know, like trying to walk. Um, so this is just, this is an apical scotoma in real life. So this is a 10 degree, uh, 20 diopter prism at about 36 inches is enough to make my head disappear. So we're going to call that mission failed because that doesn't really help us. Um, so now we don't want to do that. We want to avoid um, the apical scotoma. So the next attempt at lenses for homonymous hemianopia was this, which would be called a unilateral sector prism. So what unilateral is, is instead of bilateral, bi meaning both eyes, now we have unilateral, meaning we just put the prism on one eye. So let's see what happens now. So now we still have our same petting zoo, full visual field, hemivisual field. Now we're going to treat each eye separately. So in this patient who has a left hemianopia, we have the prism on the left eye. So it'll be on the outside of the left eye. So we would just have a prism here. No prism here, just a prism here. So let's see what happens. So our right eye, when it gazes into the full lens that does not have the prism, is going to see the frog. The left eye that has the prism, just like we saw before, the frog's going to disappear and see the jellyfish. 
So there's one of three things that can happen when the brain is presented with this information. So the first one is that one of the eyes will be like, get me out of here. This is confusing and just shut off. So that would be suppression. So one eye could suppress. The other thing that could happen is if the prism is not terribly strong, the eyes could converge, meaning fuse. Um, so they could just overpower the prism and make a single image, which defeats the purpose of field expansion. The third thing that could only, that would be the only thing that would be considered field expansion is this, which is this awkward love child of a, of a jellyfish and a frog. Um, and that is uncomfortable. So that's the only scenario that could possibly be considered field expansion. Now, the other, the other kind of concept that is confusing here is that we're putting a prism where a patient is blind and telling them to look into it when they want to see the area where they're blind. So let's think about that in terms of ourselves. So let's say that I, Charlie Saccarelli, wanted to have awareness of back here all the time what would I do? Would I look like this all the time? That's, that's, I mean, that's essentially what I would have to do, right? Unless I mounted some kind of weird rear view mirror somewhere on my body to give me awareness of that, which is kind of what bikers do. Um, but this is not, this is not a particularly um, helpful way to look over there, right? We don't want to actively look into an area that we're not normally inclined to look to. So we're going to say that mission failed too. And now our next mission objective is to avoid double vision, which not the album though. Listen to the album, look up the album. It's a classic. So this is a little exercise that I'm going to take you through to show you how double vision works. So look here, just follow the instructions. So look here. And as you look here, I'm going to pop some stuff into the corners. And as long as you're looking here, the stuff in the corners doesn't really bother you, right? So you got the word peripheral running in all four corners, but as you're looking here, the word peripheral doesn't really bother you. I can even make it double in the peripheral vision and it still doesn't bother you. The only time that your double vision is bothersome is in the central. So it's important to recognize that distinction is that you are not sensitive to double vision unless it's in your central vision. So now we're going to talk a little bit about peripheral prisms. So the way peripheral prisms work is I'm going to put these on again and then put a little fit over over them. So so by looking so right now I look into the camera I have hemianopia essentially. Now this is called gaze contingent hemianopia and that if I go this way I become completely blind and if I go this way I don't have hemianopia. But without a brain surgery this is the closest we can come. So what I have here is a pair of the peripheral prisms, and the way that the peripheral prisms work is they sit in your peripheral vision. So I, right now I can still see the camera, and as I see the camera, I have an awareness of my hand that is over here. So that is how those work, and they sit in the vision versus not in the vision. So rather than having to proactively look into an area that you may or may not detect the potential for disaster um, versus having it fed to you all the time. So we're not inclined to look in an area where we're blind. So let's see how that, um, so this is a demo of how that looks. So this would be the scene of, of the patient. So this would be their field, and then this would be the scene. The pink is, uh, bad it's like a webcam version of the um of the field loss best i could do now let's show you how the field looks versus the scene when you do peripheral prism so now we have the hemianopia we have the prism and it so the hand is actually over here but it pulls in to the patient's existing visual field now that's not what their visual field test would look like. Their visual field test would look like this. Their visual field test would show that they have field expansion. So that's success from a standpoint of expanding the visual field for hemianopia. 
Now, what's the functionality of that? <clears throat> now, there are certain times when having an expanded visual field is useful, and then there's some times when having prisms in front of your eyes will be annoying. So the one, the one potential benefit of the unilateral sector prism is that it's, not, it's never in your way um, because it's not doing anything. So when you put the prisms in front of your eyes, now they do something and they're doing something all the time. So it's a matter of, okay, what tasks and what situations will this be useful? So the main situation that this will be useful is mobility, when you are walking around. Um, situations like reading a book or watching TV or just sitting somewhere, they're not particularly useful in those scenarios. So you would want something that is removable. You would want something that the patient doesn't have to wear all the time. So there's two designs. So also depending on how we, how we work out the prisms, how we set up the prisms, we can expand the field in a different way, which is pretty cool. So if we, if we do them just base out, we will expand the field just base out. Now, if we do them base out and down and base out and up, now we create awareness of this midline area. Now, the function of the midline is that, so if we were driving, this would be the visor and this would be the dashboard. So in that scenario, this field and this field is not particularly useful, but this field's pretty useful in that, hey, now I can see out the windshield with my expanded field. This is not an endorsement for driving under any circumstance. What this is, is the function of oblique prisms giving you awareness of the midline and also recognizing that most patients don't care that you told them not to drive. They will drive anyways. And if you suspect they're driving, it would be better if they have a little bit of awareness of what's outside their windshield. Now, a lot of people ask about the Fresnel prism and why wouldn't you use a higher quality prism? So when we were first designing the product, we were super, um, we were super uh, focused on making the best eye, the best ophthalmic quality prism. And we ended up with these just massively thick prisms that nobody would wear. Um, and what we discovered is that the area that we place these prisms, the patient's acuity is so low that it's not particularly important. Um, so this, like I said earlier for Australia, this, this is the acuity just from this side of the prism. So the prism closest to the pupil and then the, pr the part of the prism furthest away from the pupil, the acuity goes from 640 to, ah, sorry. The acuity goes from 640 to 6120, just from here to here and here to here. So it's not, um, not that big of a help to have a better ophthalmic quality prism. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about how, what the general strategies are in field expansion. So when we want to expand the visual field, we want the prism to sit in the visual field and we want it to bring information from where the patient is blind. So when we're doing that, we want to do two things. We don't want to obstruct the patient's lateral eye movements, right? We don't want to obstruct the patient's lateral eye movements. Um, but other than that, pretty much anywhere in this 120 degree binocular vision, you can potentially steal from to bring information from a blind area into a seeing area. So this strategy gets um, fairly uh, ornate, which I can talk about a little bit, but um, I'm also, so at the end, my contact information is in here. And I can, I mean, if you, if you can send me visual fields, if we can talk about it, I mean, there's, there's usually something that can be done. And a lot of times it's a little bit weird, but I'm available. Call me if you want or figure it out. Um, so pretty much any patient with field loss has the potential to benefit from peripheral prisms. Um, in mobility situations. So basically like people who complain that it feels like people sneak up on them, they get startled easily, that they bump into things and feel unsteady. Those are potential candidates for peripheral prisms. It's not necessarily just homonymous hemianopia that it works for.
So the goals in the visual field expansion is you want to look, you kind of want to look at the visual field in three different ways. You want to look at the binocular visual field. You want to look at each monocular visual field. And then you want to take from a monocular visual field to help the binocular visual field. So that's hopefully makes a little bit of sense, but I can see why it wouldn't. Um, and the goals in field expansion is that, hey, we want to help with mobility. We want to give them um, the option to see things before they trip over them, before they run into them. So it's good to give the patient a part-time wear option. You don't want to put prisms on their glasses that they wear all the time, or they're going to not uh, be effective. They'll hate them for the wrong reasons. They'll hate them because they don't work for watching TV and they don't work for reading a book. And I know science loves um, science loves like double blind studies and all that stuff. Um, the kind of neat thing about peripheral prisms, because field loss is a moving target, right? So I mean, other than homonymous hemianopia, which is occasionally or most of the time just straight down the middle and then a half field, um, what do you do when you have weird fields? We can't really create, you know, like a study based on diabetic retinopathy fields because they're such a crapshoot. Um, or glaucoma, feel, like they're, they're, because glaucoma is a, a degrading thing and RP is a degrading thing, it's hard to track them. It's hard to get any kind of studies related to visual field and expansion. But the cool thing is that the prisms, if you place them correctly, it's objectively measurable and verifiable. So you can actually put the patient with peripheral prisms into a Goldman, into a visual field machine, and actually measure field expansion in a useful way. So it's objectively, so it's scientifically provable on a patient by patient basis, whether or not the field expansion itself works. Now that's the objective part. Now subjective is, does the patient find it useful? Um, and if the patient does not find it useful, hey, no harm done. It's a pair of prisms on a glass. And it doesn't even need to be a pair of prisms. Sometimes it's just one prism. So here's a few different fields that I'm just going to go through as we wrap up, um, just to tell you about different scenarios and just different things that I've encountered over time. So this, I was at, um, I was at an ophthalmology conference, and uh, I was I was showing the Pelly prism, and I had an ophthalmologist walk up and tell me, yeah, these things don't work. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I have hemianopia. My doctor fit me with them and they don't work. So this guy, I, I did a confrontation field on him while we were standing there in the, uh, in the, in the hall. And uh, his left eye was this. So he had a big gaping hole in the left eye, but he actually had pretty good top and bottom fields. Um, his right eye was more, was closer to a standard hemianopia. But what, what happened is he said he lost his license and stopped driving because he kept running over mailboxes. So this was the area that was missing, right? So this was the area that he couldn't see out of. And when he showed me what he had been fit with, he was fit with horizontal prisms, which go there and there. So the expansion was essentially the same field that he already had. So it didn't really help him with his mailbox problem. So what we did was we fit him with oblique prisms. And when we fit them with oblique prisms, now we're pulling from the mailbox zone, right? So originally when we put them here and here, that wasn't particularly effective, but when we put them here, hey, that's good. So this, uh, this gentleman actually reached out to me a few months back and um, he's uh, actually publishing a paper on our work together. Um, so this will be, I'll be published in a medical journal, which is kind of cool. Um, but this was this, so this was a good fitting for oblique prisms, and this is this is a good reason and a good kind of thing to say. Okay, hey, if the patient is not, if they don't have the perfect field, you can actually put peripheral prisms on and have it be useless. Um, here's another patient with glaucoma and multiple TBIs. She had a lot of stuff going on, but the the one corner was bothering her pretty bad. Um, so what we did was just put a prism on the top um, of one eye, and that helped. So the one thing about all of these visual field expansion solutions is that they are glasses. And that's a good thing for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, that glasses can be removed. So if you don't like them, you can be removed. Um, so I've seen some stuff where they like embed stuff in retinas for blind people and that they'll put new lenses in that are automatic focus and that kind of stuff. 
And uh, if you don't like it, oops, too late. Um, this, if you don't like it, you just take them off. So that's cool. And um, just uh, the last, I, I like to end this end with this story because this this blew my mind. Um, this is Chris, and uh, Chris's mom contacted me um, after like years after her son had a uh, brain surgery and said he's really he really really wants to drive and like he's fully adapted he's functional um but he can't drive because of the laws in the state um but what we were able to do was get him a pair of oblique prisms and he went from being a couch potato to being a licensed driver with a job and all kinds of stuff just from a pair of prisms which is a pretty cool um, pretty cool thing that just a pair of prisms can do that. Here's my contact information. Um, you are welcome to email me, text me, call me, WhatsApp, Facebook. Um, as I get older, I'm not on any of the newer and cooler social media, so I'm, I'm kind of, I have kind of wedged between MySpace and Instagram, so I'm just like stuck in Facebook. Um, but yeah, hit me up if you have any questions or ever need to consult or anything. I love talking about this stuff. I won't shut up. You might need to hang up on me, but I would encourage you to reach out to me if you ever have any questions about this. And thank you so much and have a good one.